Good morning and welcome. So glad that you're here with us today. My name is Craig. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm about to knock that table over. It is our privilege to have you with us as we gather together to worship the Lord. If you have your Bible, it's going to be in the book of Genesis chapter 1. It should be relatively easy to find. The very first book, the very first chapter. While you're turning there, just uh, want to mention a couple of things. Number one, thank you so much for all the work that so many of you put in to make Easter such a wonderful success here. We did have a massive crowd. We had over 700 people in attendance last Sunday in two services. And Lord, just absolutely blessed beyond my wildest dreams. The maximum amount I would have ever expected would have been maybe 550, and we were well beyond that. Um, and I do believe that's because you guys were so diligent in praying. I believe that you've been really in, intentional in inviting others to come and be a part of our church body. So thank you so much. If you're a person that visited with us last week and came back this week, I'm so grateful that you did that. It is really our privilege to have you with us as we've come together to worship. Um, and uh, the second thing that I'm going to mention to you is that we have our very first Vacation Bible School meeting of the, of the year this afternoon at 5 o'clock. I know that doesn't necessarily fit within the sermon, but here's the deal. It's the biggest mission outreach we have every single year. So be praying for that. And if you're planning to volunteer at Vacation Bible School, I hope you'll be with us at 5 o'clock this afternoon right here in the sanctuary. All right, you should have had time to turn to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in verse 26. I'm going to ask you to stand with me in honor of God's word, and I'm going to read through the end of the chapter. Hear now, for this is the word of the Lord. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all that creeps on the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth... And to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has a breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was the evening and there was morning on the sixth day. Let's pray together. Father God, we celebrate the gift and the beauty of marriage. And we praise you, Lord God, that you've given it to us. And you've given us instruction for how it is that we might enjoy it. I pray, Father God, that as we gather in this place, that you would speak through your word, move among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Today we're beginning a brand new sermon series on the family. We're going to see how the family is so important and so foundational for everything that takes place in society. And today we're going to look especially about marriage and how it is that marriage is so incredibly important for the family and for especially for society. Marriage really is the building block for everything that we know is culture and society but is it really that important that's the question we're wrestling with this morning is marriage really that important now i understand for some of you grammar nazis among us that that really is not really important in that question but i really want to put it in there so that i can give a little bit of emphasis is it really a big deal does it really matter all that much well the answer of course is yes according to god's word however in our culture marriage is in decline it's it's in decline all across our culture. I'm going to read a few statistics to you. In the last 50 years, the marriage rate in the U.S. has dropped by nearly 60%. A recent study found that one in four 40-year-old Americans has never been married. Two-thirds of young Americans say they feel no parental pressure to get married. Parents, what in the world are y'all doing? We've got we to work on this a little bit. Right? We need to ramp up the pressure. I want grandchildren before I turn 80, you know? I'm going to tell you something. Like, once my kids get old enough, they're going to feel the pressure. Parents, pressure them. Right? Arrange some marriages. It'll be all right. I'm open to this. If you guys have got suitable opportunities, come see me afterward. It, we, we can make this cheap. I won't charge anything. We don't need dowries. All we need is just a sign on the bottom line. Ollie, and some of our teenagers, they heard this in the first service. All four of my kids were in the first service, and they were all terrified. I'm going to tell you something. I don't care. I don't care. Some of y'all are like, I don't want to do this to my children. Y'all need to get over that, parents, all right? We need to be working to identify the good options, and we need to be getting together and help them to understand what's out there for them, right? Left to themselves, who knows what they might bring home. Y'all got, we got to work on this. Um, thank you. I needed that amen. That's good. I needed that. 
don't want my daughters bringing home some losers. Some of y'all got good young men in your life, right? I need to know about these guys, okay? Um, and look, I've got two wonderful sons. I mean... <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying. I just want y'all to know. At, at multiple ages. So y'all come see me afterward. We're good. <laughs> there should be some degree of pressure, right? I mean, why? why? Because mar- marriage is normal. Because then, don't get ahead of me yet. But, but we, we got to get into this. But it, it's a big deal. Listen, only 17% of those who self-identify as liberal see the decline in marriage as a negative thing for our culture. That should concern us, okay? However, and, and only 60% of those who identify as conservative see the decline in marriage as a problem for our culture. Some of y'all get all uncomfortable when I talk about politics. And y'all like to draw this hard line and be like, Craig, you got to understand. There's one side that's right and one side that's wrong. And the reason that I'm always calling y'all above the political sphere and above the, above the political fray is because I need you to understand that the best case scenario is that 60% of one political persuasion recognizes marriage to be important. Do you, do you realize there is nobody consistently in our culture that is really clinging to conservative values, the idea that there's a political party out there that really gets Jesus is a lie. Here's what they get. They get what it takes to get your vote. And as followers of Christ, we've got to be above that. You can't call yourself conservative if you aren't interested in conserving the most important of all societal institutions. The most foundational of all of our institutions is the marriage. And if marriage is not conserved, it doesn't really matter what you say about yourself politically. You don't get Jesus in God's word. We've got to be about marriage above all else. It is foundational for society and for culture. Listen, we have a responsibility to cling to what God's word has to say about marriage. And so in this passage of scripture, I want us to see three things that are super important for our understanding of marriage as it relates to our society and our culture. The first thing this morning is all we've got to understand is that marriage is normal. Marriage is normal. Now, I didn't say that everybody who gets married is normal. I didn't say that at all. As a matter of fact, one of the beautiful things about God's grace towards us is he allows some real weird people to find each other and they can still get married. Right? And then he also allows some pretty normal people to find some weird people and not recognize how weird they are. I am proof positive of that, Right? Angela met me and was willing to look past all my weirdness and was willing to be married to me anyway. And I'm so grateful for it every day of my life. So when I say that marriage is normal, I'm, I'm not suggesting that like married people are normal and non-married people are not normal. I'm saying that marriage is the normal expectation in God's word. People are sort of expected to get married, okay? The biblical expectation is for people to get married. This is why the Lord says when he creates Adam and Eve, he's going to go on in the... We, we really have two creation accounts in the book of Genesis, right? you got the creation account in Genesis 1, and you got the creation account in Genesis 2. In the creation account in Genesis 2, he says that... Uh, um, uh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. In, in the creation account in Genesis 1, he says, God bless them, said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, have dominion over it, right? So there's an expectation that they, they are, they're fruitful, that they are producing children there. And then in chapter 2, he said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will find a helper fit for him. Now he formed, um, uh, so out of the ground, and he moves on down. Uh, verse 20, the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds of the heaven, to the, every beast on the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and he closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and he brought her to man. And he said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. This is the expectation, right? The normal expectation is that most people will get married. Most people will leave their family of origin and they will be united to a partner and they will form their own family 
unit. Marriage is normal. Now look, it's not only a biblical expectation. Turns out that it's sort of a normal expectation. In 1976, um, something like 76% of all high school seniors said they expected to get married. Do you know that in 2020, that number was still 71%? It turns out the majority of people, even at 17 or 18 years old, are expecting that they will get married. It's normal, right? We should should see it as so normal that, look, as parents, we should be telling our children that we're expecting you to get married. You're not wrong as a parent for saying this. As a matter of fact, I'll say this. You may be wrong as a parent for not expecting your children to get married, right? Stop being a helicopter parent trying to keep them at home. And that's hard. I don't want mine to grow up either. I love having them around. But I am so excited for grandbabies one day. And I'm excited for y'all's kids to have children. I want to just hold those babies and send them back home. That's exciting for me. I don't have to change the diapers. I'm not in that business. I'm in the business of looking at them, giving them little kisses and sending them on their way. Go back home to where you came from. But we celebrate these gifts, these beautiful gifts that God gives. Parents, unless we are training up our children to launch out of the nest and to have their own families, we can't expect them to not do it. Some of y'all can't figure out why kids are failing to launch. Some of it has to do with the fact that we're not saying to them, we expect you to do this. We expect it. This is normal. All right? So marriage is normal. So, well, Craig, what what about those people who who aren't married? So what are you trying to say? Listen, I want to say this. Being single is not a curse. Being single is not a curse. When I say that marriage is normal, what I mean is that that's what most people are going to do. But the Lord has set apart certain people with incredible opportunities because of their singleness. Some of the people that accomplish the most in God's kingdom throughout history have been single people in the Word of God. Jesus, of course, was single. That's the, the, the example that we can't really compare ourselves to. But the Apostle Paul was single, right? The Apostle Paul was not married. Apostle Paul went so far as to say, I wish that there were others of you who were as I am. Because Paul understood that as a single person, he wasn't encumbered by some of the same things that a married person is encumbered by. It's an incredible privilege to be married, but when I got married, I took upon myself the responsibility to care for another human. Angela and I became one person. That's the way the Bible describes us. And so the decisions that I made were suddenly not just Craig's decisions. They were Craig and Angela's decisions. And then when my children came along, they were Craig, Angela, and the children's decisions. Every decision I make has a ripple effect on all the people that live inside of my household. So um, guess what? Single people don't have that responsibility, right? Those people that never married, those people that never had children, you know who they have to worry about? Themselves, and that's it. They can do incredible things. This is why... For those of you who are not yet married, our young people that have not yet really taken those steps, man, things like mission opportunities are incredible for you. You can take a month or two months or three months and go and do whatever you want to do because there's nobody else dependent upon you. As parents, we got a hard time letting you go, right? We, but as parents, we got to get a little better about that. We got to get a little bit better about encouraging our children to leave the nest and to go and to use their youth and their singleness for the glory of God. It's incredible opportunities. Marriage is the normal expectation, but single people, they're not cursed. And y'all, here's the other thing. Those folks that are single within our church body, they are incredibly valuable. Whether you're single because you never married, single because you were divorced, single because you're widowed, there's incredible opportunities for you. And as married folks, we got to make sure that we're always looking at the single people around us and welcoming them, welcome, welcoming them into the larger sphere of our household and of our family. There's incredible opportunities and responsibilities here. Okay, So we see, though, that marriage is, is normal and should be desired. We should be striving for it, encouraging our young people to pursue it. The second thing this morning, marriage is the foundation for families. Marriage is the foundation for families. Listen, marriage creates a secure environment for children to be born into. And children need security. They need it. They need it when they're little. They need it when they aren't so little. Do you know that grown children need security? It's an incredible privilege To be a grown child, to be 30 or 40 years old, and to have a family of origin that is healthy enough to be a safety net for you even when things get get bad. Do, Do you understand what a wonderful privilege that is? 
that security in a marriage creates opportunities for children to thrive and to grow. This is what happens. This is what happens when we have that foundation for families. Now, do I, do I need to, to give you the stats? Because I can't. Why does marriage matter so much? Because children that come, uh, that are born into unwed families, children born to unwed mothers, they have higher rates of teen pregnancy. They have higher rates of high school dropout. They have higher rates of STDs. They have higher rates of failing grades. They have higher rates of, of imprisonment. They die earlier. Like this is the statistics, right? These aren't things I'm making up. These are statistics that are well known. Children that are born into single parent homes are less likely to attend church. They're less likely to escape poverty, right? These are the things that happen. This isn't just something that like the Baptist preacher makes up. These are statistics that are true across all of our society and across all of our culture. It's important for us to understand that God has created marriage because God understood that the most important thing, the best way for children to thrive was them, for them to be born into a family, a married family where there was support and safety and st structure and security. And it's within those bounds that children can flourish. Have y'all ever seen the research studies about children on playgrounds? Once upon a time, it was believed that the best thing you could do was give children all the freedom in the world and they'd go and play. Well, there's been several studies that have shown that what happens if you put kids out in an open field, they tend to huddle up together, right? But if you put them in a field of similar size with a fence around it, the children explore all of the corners of that playground. Why? Because they, they're looking for some kind of boundaries. And it's within those boundaries that they feel safe and secure. Within a healthy, loving family with a mom and a dad that love one another and are committed, children find safety and security. It's inside of those bonds, those bounds that they can explore, they can grow the most. Right? So children need that. The second thing, though, this morning is that marriage is a picture of Christ and his church for children. If you have your Bibles and you can find it, turn to Ephesians chapter 5 with me. It's okay if you can't get there. Uh, you can just write it down and I'm, I'm going to read it to you. You can go back and find it later. But Ephesians chapter 5 uh, says, beginning in verse 31, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So that's a quote from the book of Genesis. And then verse 32, the apostle Paul says, This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife, as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This mystery is profound and I'm saying it refers to Christ as church. The apostle Paul says that the marriage relationship is actually a picture of Jesus and his church. And, and, and he's helping us to understand. So if marriage is a picture of Christ and his church, this is incredibly important, important for our children. Because when I love my wife well, sacrificially, then I am showing my children what true love is. And if the Apostle Paul says that marriage is supposed to be a picture of Christ and his church, he's saying that as a husband, my responsibility is to love my wife the way that Jesus loved his church. And Jesus loved his church by sacrificing for his church, by dying for the church. And so Paul is helping us to understand the nature of Christ and the church and the nature of marriage. And so when we apply that to our responsibility as married people within our families before our children. What we understand is that our children are understanding a lot about who Jesus is and how Jesus loves his church. You ready? By the way that you men love your wives. And this is an incredible burden for us. It's an incredible responsibility. Men, you impact the way that your children view Jesus and his church. And you impact them based on the way that you love your wife. We like to talk a lot about leading in the home as men. But over and over and over again, and we're going to see this come back up multiple times in the next few weeks as we talk about the family. Over and over and over again, the Bible encourages husbands and fathers to love their wives. Not lead them, love them. Some of y'all like to talk about leading because y'all want to lead. Because leading's a heck of a lot easier than loving. When I lead, I can just tell you what to do and then I can go do something else. When I love you, I gotta walk with you. 
When I love you, I don't get to lord it over you as the Gentiles do. Instead, when I love you as Jesus has commanded me, then I've got to wrap a towel around my waist and I've got to wash feet. I've got to serve. This is the leadership that we've been called to as husbands and fathers. This is what's supposed to happen in our homes. When you're asking lots of questions about how it is that you can lead your wife, it's usually because you're not loving her. If you'll love her well, the leadership will come. If you will love your children well, the leadership will come. You won't have to worry a whole lot about it. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. How was it that Jesus has led his church? He led the church by dying for the church. And we looked at just last week. He gave himself on the cross and he rose from the grave, overcoming death, hell, sin, and the grave so that we might experience life everlasting. Jesus led by example, led by loving. And then we're chasing after him. We're pursuing after Christ. We want to be like him. And the Apostle Paul says that as, as husbands, you are actually supposed to love your wives so well and so sacrificially that she is more godly because of you. That you are to love your children so well that they are more godly because of you. That you are to lead them in the things of the Lord so passionately that they look more like Jesus because of you. This is our responsibility. And this is why marriage is the foundation for our families because when I handle marriage well, I create a secure environment for my children to thrive and I give them a picture of Jesus and his church. This is a side note that's not in here, but do y'all know how difficult it is for a person who grew up with an abusive father to understand the love of a heavenly father. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. And men, if you think that you're going to lord your responsibility or your right or your position as a husband and father over your wife and children... It sort of force them into this submission where they're going to honor you and Jesus. You got it all wrong. You don't get to lead them in the way that Jesus didn't lead you. Your home is not your castle where you come home to rule. It is the cross where you are called to die daily serving Jesus and your family. We got a responsibility and if our marriages are going to thrive and be healthy, they are going to, they're going to rise and fall on the willingness of men to step up and to be men in their home. Marriage is necessary. It's the foundation for families. It's normal. And then third this morning, marriage is necessary for society. If you don't believe me in this, I want you to consider what's been called the success sequence. And this is what the success sequence is. The success sequence is this. If, if you, as a, as a high school student, right? right? If any high school student do this. They'll graduate high school, get a full-time job, and they get married before they have children. There's a 97% chance that they will not be living in poverty by the time they're 30 years old. You hear that? Like, again... This isn't just coming from the Baptist preacher. I'm just telling you the facts. If you will graduate high school, get a full-time job, get married and then have children, there's a 97% chance that you will not be in poverty by the time you're 30. This isn't for the greatest generation. This isn't for baby boomers. This is for millennials. This is the facts that happen for millennials. Okay? 97% chance. If you reverse that, you have children before you get married and you don't finish school, there's something like a 60% chance that you'll be in poverty by the time you're 30. It turns out that the Lord knew exactly what he was doing. When the creator gives you the blueprint and tells you how to, how to run the machine, how arrogant and stupid do we have to be to assume that we know better than he does? All right? So marriage is necessary for society. It's necessary. Look, the marriage relationship is the building block for commitment. It's the basic building block. Like if we were doing Legos, marriage is like that green sheet that you lay down and everything else gets snapped to it. 
Okay? You know, the one that's supposed to be grass so you can build your house on it? I was terrible with Legos. I had to have the kits. I didn't have any of the good imagination. So, but y'all understand what I'm talking about. That, 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 that little mat that you, everything else gets snapped to, that's marriage. It's that foundational for the building block, not only of individual families, it's, it's that foundational for the building block of societies. Now, I want to go through some, some other statistics here. I know I've been a little statistic heavy this morning, but, but the, the, the marriage relationship builds commitment beyond your household. Okay, It builds commitment beyond your household. Listen to this. Married people are more likely to be engaged in religious and civic activities than those people who never married. All right, so how, how much more likely? Married people are 10 to 20% more likely than never married people to attend a community meeting, to talk with others within their community, to visit a library, to volunteer in their community, right? Now, they're also 10 to 20% more likely to attend a church service. But just understand, married people are the backbone of your, of your communities. They're doing all the stuff. Now, look, some of that has to do with the fact that some of y'all that are, that are single parents especially, you ain't got time for all that. You don't. And, and I'm not here to beat up on single people. I, I don't have, there, I, I bet there is not a single parent in this church building today in either service who says, you know what, it's a lot easier to be a single parent. It's tough. This is why the church is so important for single parents, right? Y'all know that it's hard. This is why it's so important that we don't just cast our single friends aside. We come alongside them. We support them. They got it tough. But healthy societies are being built on married people. Let's, let's keep going. It's been common in some circles of our culture to downplay the importance of marriage. Um, and, and, and they do that because, just to be totally honest, we, we do. We feel bad talking about this stuff because there's a lot of folks that don't have the opportunity to come from a two-parent household, right? There's, there's a lot of people that are impacted by divorce or, or grew up with a single mom or whatever the case might be. And so we don't speak the truth because the truth hurts. But y'all, we got to speak the truth even when the truth is hard. We, we have to speak the truth. Because we need to warn the generations coming behind us that there's a better way. And we have to do it as the church because, listen, our culture's not doing it. Our government's not doing it. Our, our, our government has created tax codes that actually make it less advantageous to be married than to not be married. And it doesn't matter at what age, right? There's some of you that have wrestled with this as senior adults because you've had to wrestle with the reality that you get, you get disadvantaged to be married as it relates to Social Security as, as a retired person. We don't give advantages to married people who have children at the same level that we give to unmarried people who have children. And so we're not giving government, the government's not doing anything to help us, okay? But in addition, like we, we have to understand that marriages, the relationship between families and the larger culture is more symbiotic than substitutionary. It's, it's more interdependent than it is interchangeable. So a symbiotic relationship is one that's, that's beneficial for everybody. So we don't talk about the value of marriage and the family because we don't want to hurt people's feelings and we don't want to offend them. But what we have to come to grips with is the fact that when married people, married couples are healthy and families are healthy, they don't just have the opportunity to impact their own household. They actually make everybody else around them better. There's a symbiosis, there's a symbiotic relationship, it's an interdependence. Side note, hey, this is why it's so important that we work diligently to have a healthy church body. Because if our church body is healthy, we actually have the opportunity as a church body to have a positive impact on the communities that we, impact, that we, that we encounter. We can have a symbiotic relationship with the world around us. We can make them better because of our pursuit of excellence. So in other words, strong two-parent families become this bedrock for society, and they raise the tide for everybody, right? And the, the, the last thing, though, this morning is, is that marriage also brings order from chaos and allows for the exercising of dominion. So right there in Genesis 1, we run back to that. 
So then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the living things, over everything that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue and have dominion. This exercise of dominion, we can, we can have the idea here that what we're doing is we're, we're sort of taming society and making it livable or usable. So we generally think of this in agricultural terms, but exercising dominion comes all the way down to like engineering, right? We exercise dominion when we build bridges. We exercise dominion when we build societies and civilizations and cultures. That's an exercising of dominion. That's bending creation into forms that are usable for God's people. And, and I'm using God's people here in, in the broadest sense of the word, image bearers of God. Okay? So this is what dominion is. And marriage brings order out of the chaos, and it actually allows me to exercise dominion. How? Because when I got married, the chaos of my life suddenly had to be tamed down so that we could live as one group, one unit that could get along. So engagement is awesome for men, right? I mean, it is. You think about it. Guys, you bought the ring. You mustered up the courage. You got down on one knee. You said, will you marry me? She said, yes. You said, man, game over. I won. We're good. All your worries vanished in that moment, right? You remember that? Some of y'all, yeah, I know that, right? All of a woman's worries began in that moment, right? So it doesn't matter if it's six months or 12 months to the wedding. All of a sudden, all the planning begins. Men, what are you worried about? She calls you one day and says, do you have a tux? You say, no. She says, you need to get a tux, and your groomsmen need to get a tux. You say, sure thing. And you call up, and you say, I need a tux. And you go, and they measure you, and then one day you just go pick it up. It's like magic. It's just waiting for you. You just write them a check, and they have it all there. And then you're like, oh, I got that taken care of. And the only other thing you're worried about is you want to make sure there's chicken nuggets there when you get ready for the wedding because you don't want to be hungry when you walk down that aisle. You know, and you're good. Absolutely crushing it at that point. And what, what is this woman worried about? Everything. I mean, there's caterers, there's flowers. <laughs> the only time that a man worries about a wedding is when he's the father of the bride and he's writing the checks. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he's worried sick about all of it. He wants to meet all the caterers. Like, no, we'll take the small shrimp, sir. Um, but I mean, you think about it. We, we're not, we don't, as men, we're not thinking about any of those things. We're just living in, in sort of the chaos of the moment. Our, our lives, man, we're just living by the, we're, we're living just in the moment. When we get married and all of a sudden there's, a, there's like a shared calendar. There's a shared budget. There's somebody else for me to answer to if I'm late from work or if I hang out with my friends. There's, there's, there's order that has to be brought out of the chaos of my life. Do you know that, that that's sort of the first step? In our exercising dominion of our own lives, it allows us to then begin exercising dominion beyond our own life. That, that commitment in our marriage is the first step. Once I, once I begin to exercise dominion here and in my own household, like I begin to bring order there, then I actually have the ability to start bringing order in other places. I, I, I have the, the opportunity to begin to exercise my authority and to bring dominion, to exercise dominion in other little spheres. And ultimately, y'all, that's what society is. A healthy one, anyway. It's this interlocking series of human beings exercising dominion to bring about a cooperative effort for a functional culture society. One of the breakdowns in marriage is, is the lack of realization that your marriage is bigger than you. We, we've embraced this lie that marriage is all about making me happy. And if I'm not happy, then my marriage is failing. Y'all, marriage is bigger than you. Your marriage is a part of this church. You think about that. I mean, let's, before we get all the way out beyond it, your marriage is a part, an integral part of the fabric of this church body. And if your marriage fails, then it impacts a large sphere. Y'all, here's the other thing. The idea that marriage is all about making you happy. Y'all, do you know that any marriage that stands the test of time, there's going to be some times when you're unhappy. There's going to be some times when you're unhappy. 
Angela's grandparents were married for like 60 years. I don't remember. They've been married forever. And so before we got married, we, we, what, what, what was the secret? And Angela said, you know, Granny, what, what, was, like, what was it that, that allowed y'all to be married for so long? She said, honey, I had my sewing room and your papa had his shop. <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that, right? There's a whole lot of being married that has to do with just staying married. I know that that's not real romantic for our young people or maybe some of you that's been married just for a short period of time. But the romance is going to be built on the foundation of just sticking it out when times are tough. Men, the romance is going to be built on the foundation of you continuing to be there even when you don't want to be there. Honest and truly, it's going to be built on your willingness to suck it up and get over yourself. And to think about something bigger than you. And that bigger than you is even bigger than your relationship with your spouse. Because it impacts your relationship with your children. It impacts your community. Your church, it impacts your larger family. All of those things have a bearing. They're, they're impacted by you. And when you decide that you're going to be selfish just because you're not happy, suck it up. Sometimes we're all unhappy. That's just life. I don't know who told you you were going to be happy all the time. But it's a lie. Sometimes you're going to be unhappy. And the greatest strength is going to be found in the struggle. Your marriage is going to be better at 35 years because you can look back at how difficult year 14 was and you made it. You made it. Then it's going to be okay. And your world is going to be better because you suffered together and because you knew that when everything else ended, at the end of the day, no matter what else happened, you were still going to be married because it was permanent. And you were a lot more committed to being married than you were to anything else. So where do we go from here? Is marriage really that important? Yes. It's worth fighting for. It's worth suffering for. And can I tell you this? It's even worth being unhappy for every once in a while. It's worth not getting your way for. It's worth it. Marriage is necessary for society. And it's about more than you. And so this morning, our invitation is really simple. What needs to change in your life as it relates to your approach to marriage? See, when we talk about marriage, it's difficult. Because 14-year-olds are not sure they even need to listen. Listen, I want you all to know that the most important sermon I ever heard on parenting was in December of 1999. I was 18 years old. Before I ever knew my wife or ever even thought about having children, I heard a sermon on, on parenting that has impacted all of my parenting since that day, since I had children. So don't discount a sermon on marriage just because you're not ready to be married yet. So for some of you at 14, 15, 16, 18, 20 years old, what are your thoughts about marriage that need to shift as a result of this? For some of you though, some of you that are married, what are the thoughts about marriage that need to shift today? For some of you, you got children and grandchildren that are just struggling today. What do you need to pray that would shift in their situation? As we sing this morning, however it is that the Lord has called you to respond, I trust that you will. You're welcome to come here and pray. Whatever it is that God's leading you to do. If I could pray with you, I'd love to. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we love you and thank you so much for this day. We celebrate the institution of marriage and your willingness, Lord God, to meet us in our loneliness, Lord God, not leave us there. I thank you, Father God, that you've given us the blueprint for families and relationships. Lord God, I pray that we would be, we'd stand out in a culture, Lord God, as people who are committed to you and committed to one another. Move among us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all stand with us this morning as we sing.
Thank you for joining with us here online at Malvern Hill Baptist Church. We would love to get to know you better and to pray with you. If you would like to be contacted for prayer or to find out how to become a follower of Christ, or maybe you just want to find out more about Malvern Hill, please fill out our connection card online at www.malvernhill.org connect. You can also go there to our website. You'll find a lot of information about our church. There's sermons, there's resources. There's other tools that can help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can even give to the work of ministry right there from our website. Thank you so much for being here with us. We hope that you can join us in person very soon. But until that time, I pray that God would bless you in this week as you seek to honor Him with your life. I hope to see you soon. Have a great week.